The next part of our uh, event today is a Q&A with all of the speakers. Uh, so we'll be, we have a couple questions to kick things off, uh, and then we'll be taking questions from the audience. So if you have anything, drop it in the Q&A tool. Uh, and from here, I'd love to welcome back our three speakers. Hi, everyone. Hey. Welcome back. Uh, our first question uh, is, um, many organizations have data, and they have data scientists. Uh, but they don't have this digital transformation that they feel they've invested in. Why do you think that is? That's a question for all of you. Well, Rachel, you want to go first? OK. I, um, <laughs> I think a lot of it is potentially down to a misunderstanding of what data science can and cannot do for an organization. I think there is a large amount of fictional belief that, that, that machine learning and AI and data science are this, this, this mythical beast that can come in and solve an organization's entire um, issues. Um, what needs to happen is that the business needs to, to, to understand what is involved in every part of the data process from cradle to grave. Um, and there is no leap of faith that you can just do. The, the, the business has to be in from the get-go and it has to understand the entire process. Without understanding all that, then there's this belief that once you've got the data, then the data will just, just magically form business decisions and that's not the case. Yeah. If, if I may add, I think uh, I completely agree with Rachel. I think uh, two things uh, are clear here. One is technology or, or the functionality, you know, per se, is not the strategy. Um, and, and I think organizations tend to confuse uh, that, tend to confuse the means with the end. So the data and the technology that, that it brings are, are not exactly the objective. They are just, a, you know, a means to get to an end. Um, and the other thing, and, and it happens in digital transformation in, in, in general, is that in order for a company to be really data-driven, uh, you need to transform not the tools, not the warehouse. Your transformation starts here. Uh, you, 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 start, you, you need to think as a data-driven company. It's not just having the toys and the bells and whistles. Um, if, you, if, you, if you don't act and you don't believe yourself to be a data-driven company and start acting like one, then, then unfortunately, most of this is going to end up as a, as a very expensive hobby. Martin, what do you think? We do have a, we do have a great uh, data transformation strategy, I think, and we're moving in the right direction. But in every day, you, you see the difference between strategy and culture, right? Culture is something that evolves a lot slower than a strategy. Even if the company gives resources, makes the right decisions, it's still not that the culture will change that fast. An industrial company will stay an industrial company for a long time because the people are used to do what they did the last years in the same matter. So cultural changes take a lot longer than strategic, strategic changes or, or uh, goals that are set by management. There's actually a nice follow-up question from the audience uh, going a bit further in this topic. Um, and it's that companies talk a lot about AI uh, but actually, the penetration and adoption and buy-in is less than expected. So in these sort of more advanced use cases, um, I know two of your talks have, were about uh, AI applications specifically. Uh, why do you think that um, the buy-in isn't there? Maybe, well, I, I, I think it, it kind of like st starts from the same idea, right? I mean, you, you, maybe you, you're hiring... Um, many of us, like data geeks as, as we are, <laughs> um, expecting that that's going to just, you know, make you more competitive just because you have it. And just because your competitor has a data science team, you need to have one too. And I think that's, that's again, I think that's a, it's a wrong approach. Um, if you think about, you know, the technology that we are deploying right now, it, you know, most of the technology has been out there for 20 years or more, 30 years. Neural networks are like, you know, really old concept and the same as as decision trees and all the different things that we do in data science. Um, so, so it needs to start by, from a business case. It, it needs to make sense from a business point of view. And I think, uh, for instance, we tend to focus uh, only, from a data science perspective, only on problems that have uh, a business case, that have a real value proposition for us 
and uh, most likely and, and more importantly for our customers in the end. Uh, the, the other problem I think is that companies don't realize that uh, machine learning, as, as um, was just mentioned, is it, not a new thing. It's based on probabilities. It's based upon statistical analysis. It's nothing really clever or new. What, what is different is the ability to learn to do machine learning with models and have a whole load of data out there to learn from. But ultimately, that data needs to be accurate. If your data is not accurate, then your machine learning isn't going to be worth anything. And we've seen this before from, from, from many sort of real life examples where companies have put out what they thought was the, the latest and greatest uh, machine learning example and suddenly discovered that, that the, the data is predicated upon it was less than ideal. And now the machine learning is pretty awful and you know, it, it's proven to be embarrassing. Companies need to understand that without good data, without clean data and without accurate data, then you might as well just, 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 just expect a child to learn just from watching um, the TV 24-7. You know, there needs to be structure, there needs to be understanding behind that data before you can employ the data science. Nice. Yes, and, and very often the goals are set very high. So you come from a hyped perspective, right, a hyped um experience what do you want to do with machine learning so let's automate the complete forecast the financial forecast let's complete completely automate it well this is a very high goal to 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 use machine learning on your like first experiences and i think most of the companies take a very very large goals very uh, complex goals to apply or make their first machine learning experiences why not start on a, a lower level that's what we did. We wanted to have, like Rachel said, we wanted to have fixed the potholes, clean the data up, and use machine learning just to get a highly automated reporting and a, a good dashboard without manual import. That's something good. That's not a, a noble cause, right? Machine learning sometimes searches for a too noble cause, right? Mm. To fully automate everything. And I think that's you will make very bad experiences with that, right? not getting accurate predictions or having a lot to do and have a lot more effort than you expected, why not start on the ladder a couple steps deeper and make your first experiences there and then go up the ladder? I yeah. think that's the wrong approach some companies do. Always go to the top of the ladder first. I, I agree completely, uh, Martin. And, uh, and the other thing that I think happens is that then you want to you want to solve everything like with a big hammer and it's not necessary. Sometimes, you know, an average and a standard deviation will get you there and there's no need to, you know, blow things out of proportion. Um, and, uh, and, and I think probably the, the other message that could be out there is that if you're small as a company, then that's something you can't do. That's just only for, for the guys that are huge in the world that have the muscle to hire, you know, a, a big team. And you, you, you can, by all means, start small. But I think, you know, in, in my personal opinion, what's, what's really critical is that you start small, but you start with something that makes sense from a business point of view. And then you, you continue building up on, to, you know, up on that. Um, maybe you're, you start with automation. Maybe that's one way to do it. I think you need to focus in general to make better decisions. You know, just, just try and do that. Then you, you, can, you can start changing, as Martin was saying, the culture to a more data-driven culture uh, than just doing the things, the same things as you have been doing, you know, before, because it's worked for us. And I think that's that's kind of like the barrier that we that we encounter in organizations in general. And I think ultimately, um, you need to understand that just because um, a company can come in and say we can solve all your problems with machine learning doesn't mean anything at all. That simply means that they've got some really good salespeople on the team who can spin a lie and make you buy into it. Yeah, that should be a red flag problem. Yeah, and actually we have a, we have a question in here about outsourcing. Uh, you know, when do you know uh, whether you should be outsourcing uh, data science work? So maybe I'll ask it to Rachel who just brought it up. So, um, First things first, you should never outsource anything unless you have an in-house team who understands exactly what's going on. 
if you outsource um, some work to a company and you let them um, run the game, then that outsourcing project is going to fail because the company that you're using is going to be looking out for themselves and their profits first and foremost. Um, if you get some benefit out of it, well, that's just luck and fortitude. Um, ultimately, outsourcing is never going to work unless you've got a very good handle on what it is you're outsourcing. So don't think about outsourcing just for the sake of outsourcing. Look at it as outsourcing in terms of stock augmentation, that perhaps you need um, several people to work on data cleansing um, before you can start doing um, any data modeling. Well, that as long as you've got people in-house who understand the purpose of, of, of the, the project and, and who can make sure that the outsourcing company are doing just that, then you've got a chance. But never outsource just because you think it's going to save the company money because it will never save the company money <laughs> martin edgar anything to add well i think uh, data science in the early stages it is right now is very hard to outsource because <laughs> you need the business knowledge right you need the business knowledge and most of the things that get outsourced today like hr or accounting well, it's very standardized, no matter what company you're talking about, right? But data science is not standardized. It's just at the beginning, like other people uh, said today. So you need a lot of business knowledge to perform it. How can you outsource that? Outsource that? Are there a lot of people who understand what your business does outside your company? <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. So data science or or approaching these challenges always need a business side. And, and we developed a role called a Data Steward at BMW that should help data scientists to understand what correlation is between the data and the business perspective. We created a special role throughout the whole company, dozens and hundreds of people who should help data scientists to understand the correlation between the data and the business. I don't think that's uh, outsourceable in the near future. It's a hard job every day. I don't think that's a standard operation that uh, even a good consulting company has. We have consulting companies um, here that will help us to uh, get better AI results um, and even work with them, but it's a hard time explaining them very company-specific procedures, processes, and how machine learning can help them. They don't know what the company in its core is doing. They can't. Yeah. I, I think it's it's hard to envision outsourcing this. Particularly, the, I think that the message that you would be sending is that this is not a critical process for your organization. If you are a data-driven company, and maybe you decide not to be, and that's fine. But if you decide to be a data-driven company, then what's exactly the message when you outsource that? Um, I don't think it's it's sending uh, that, that specific tune. The other thing is that in order to make sense of all that data, then you need to really tweak it um, for the processes and the strategic business that you're doing. And uh, I don't think you should be outsourcing that because that's gonna be uh, a lot of your, of your secret sauce of how you do things. Um, so, so I think you need to, you need to t take that approach with a grain of salt. And, um, and, and again, if, if you decide not to do it on a, from a data-driven perspective as a company, I don't know, a restaurant, you know, just, just to name up something that came to my mind, well, that's maybe okay. But, uh, but for other type of businesses that are, that are venturing into being a data-driven for better decision-making, I, I, I really don't see that happening. There, there yeah. are, you can partner with third parties mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, enhancing your data uh, and getting, you know, external data that is curated and things like that. But that's, that's outsourcing to, to bring data in, not to push data out. Yeah, and I want to I want to fit in a couple more questions. We have just a couple minutes left here. Uh, this question is for Martin. Uh, someone asked, uh, "You're a controller. How did you get this use case going? Uh, did you just start trying uh, to use Nime, or did you have to convince others, maybe in the IT department around uh, around you, to uh, to let you try Nime?" Well, we, we made a little benchmark. We had a huge IT project, and we tried to look, look into the low-code data science. <clears throat> so we compared different tools that were um, available in the Gardner Magic Quadrant for low-code data science. 
And we pretty much fell in love with Nime because everybody could use it. I mean, the other vendors are charging a lot just for trying them out or just to get to notice what the software can do. And we started um, with Nime in a team of about four people, and we really fell in love with it. And once doing all the tutorials, and we went through all the tutorials that Naim has on the web page and the um, and the exercises, and we started thinking, what can this software really help us in our daily life? <laughs> and when you start your tasks that you're very unhappy to do in your daily job, like filling in manual data, right? What job annoys you the most? As a normal working person, you will find lots of use cases that you're really motivated to bring to a success, right? Because the alternative is manual data input. So we started like the revolution from a small group of people who were just, I'm sorry to say that, lazy to put in <laughs> manual data. Thinking about how can a machine do this job that is not really adding any business value. We want to make a controlling impact in management, in decision making, right? Um, help making better decisions and, and, and to lower costs and for management. But putting in manual data really doesn't help that job at all. So I think refusal or to, to really want to make something easier and better is the best motivation you can get even as a controller. And I <laughs> helped you to put that motivation into, into something good, right? To talk about it, to make it a little bit better every day. Of course, we had help. We had other people um, telling, we, we told other people what we're doing and they were anxious to help us and, and see what input they can bring to make this machine learning algorithm better. Sure, we had help, but the motivation that keeps it going is still the refusal of doing manual work, right? That's that's what the engine is driving. And the management, of course, was very happy to see that the results uh, lead to less uh, overtime hours and to happier workers. Yeah. Sometimes it's not uh, just to cut jobs or something. You have a happier worker that is more enthusiastic about his or her job. And I think that's something that has a, a worse of something. Uh, the next question is actually uh, flipping flipping it and asking, uh, can data literacy programs be useful? Uh, and if so, what's a good place to start? Uh, so maybe Edgar or Rachel, uh, you want to chime in? I'll let Edgar take this one. <laughs> well, I think uh, all data literacy uh, you know, programs are good out there. You, know, you have one of the benefits of this past two, three years, five years of explosion in, in, in data analytics, machine learning, whatever name you want to, AI or any, any acronym that you want to add to it, is that all these programs are now available where, you know, five, 10 years ago, they were not, they were, they were only, you know, people, you know, having to go to universities and, and so on and so forth. Um, I think what's important, and I need to stress that again, is that you, you want to empower these users in companies and the students to feel that with data, they can make uh, better decisions. But with a warning sign, I mean, there is a, 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 a substantial difference between, you know, the focus on the technology, the focus on the algorithms themselves. Yes, they're important. It's always important to understand how things work, but the value doesn't come from one algorithm or the other. The, uh, the, the value comes from the business case the value comes from the end application in mind. And I think, un unfortunately, that is one problem that I see out there. And you see them with the you know, hiring process and the, and the profiles where, that companies are asking for. They're too focused on the algorithms, they're too focused on the technologies. The technologies, they pass, they fade away. Um, but uh, if you have a critical mind around using data for business decision-making, that stays. Yeah, and, and uh, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right there, Edgar, that there's this, this, this misunderstanding that just because you may have an accreditation in, in, in one form of machine learning, that now you're going to be all that in a bag of chips for years to come. <laughs> That's not really the case. It just means that you've passed an exam and you know a particular algorithm. 
if you don't really understand the business need for why you're trying to apply this, 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 this accreditation, then all you've got is a piece of paper. What you don't have is a sense of business as to where you should apply this newfound knowledge and when you should throw that newfound knowledge away because it's no longer fit for purpose. Yeah, yeah. And, but, but by the way, don't, don't get me wrong. That doesn't mean, just like in that movie uh, from, from, from Disney, right? I mean... Yeah, uh, uh, the best chef can come from anywhere, but not everybody can be a great chef. Um, it's always important to have uh, understanding and knowledge as to which organ to apply in which case. Um, I don't want to take that value away. All I'm saying that is a that is a necessary condition. That is by far not a sufficient condition for success in turning uh, this to be uh, a useful unit or department for for your organization, which is in the end what you want. You, what you don't want is in a year to have somebody asking, okay, so exactly what are we getting out of the X million dollars that we invested in this thing? Um, and, and then we, 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 we can be looking, and it's a, I think it's a, it's a danger in this area uh, at another you know, nuclear winter in a way for, for AI, because we've had at least a couple of those already. Uh, those of us, uh, those of us that are old enough to, to to remember what they look like, it's just you know something just fading away. I think it's it's important for us to to keep this going in, a, in the, with the right momentum, with the right deliverables, with the right value, so that the, the data is is here for uh, you know for us to stay for longer term. Nice. And I want to squeeze in one last question here. Uh, we just have one minute left, uh, and it's somewhat of a shameless question coming from Nine, but. Uh, a lot of data teams build solutions that are code first. Uh, can you speak to why, in your use cases, you chose a low-code or no-code solution? Um, well, for, for, for us, it's a very simple case that um, we, we, we started off code first in the ETL, um, and that is slowing us down. Um, having code-heavy environments does not help the analysts. We need low-code, no-code where they can make those decisions and they can pivot with the business rather than our ETL slowing them down. Yeah. I think sharing uh, is important. You're building a, a better team if you have at least uh, one common ground for, 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 for coding. Uh, maintenance is also a crucial part. Um, and I'd, I'd say, you know, last but not least, it, it kind of like uh, forces you into, you know, uh, a better documentation, if you will. If you look at something that is low code, if you look at a workflow in Nime, um, you don't need to explain a whole lot of what is going on. It's it's pretty it's pretty evident. You have the option of coding if you have to, and and if I don't, if you don't mind me saying, uh, in, in the group, uh, we kind of like have a kind of like a requirement that if you're gonna add uh, a snippet of code, you better have a really good reason uh, uh, for doing that instead of using a node. You don't want to create a two-class society. I mean, we are all in business, right? I'm, I'm at least <laughs> I'm on the business side, not the IT side. I understand why many people who come from the IT side or are good programmers want to choose code first. But if you're coming from the business side, you want to include as many people as possible, right? You want to, don't want to exclude anybody. And you have the risk that many of us know in the times of uh, basic uh, visual basic ap applications in Excel, right? Um, the, these things, these automations written in script code, they died with the person that coded them and left the department, <laughs> right? So they were, everybody was happy and then the person uh, got promoted, went away no matter what and the automation died again and the people left below had to solve the problem again and again and again. I know of problems that have been solved at least three times. <laughs> so this is not sustainable, right? Yeah. Coding may be a solution, but the question you have to answer, is it a sustainable solution to the problem? Again, yes. Thank I you. don't think it is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's unfortunately all the time we have left. I could listen to you guys talk forever, but I don't think... Everybody wants to listen to all of us talk forever. So thank you for your time. Uh, and thank you. Uh, hopefully we'll see you back here next year.